they wouldn't have to have their eyes working, right? In other words, signals from touch could go to the visual cortex, various parts of the brain, in fact, uh, and produce visual images. So the link, the point I'm making here is the link between the visual image, the experience, and whatever it is that's happening in the brain is a contingent link. It doesn't have to be the way it is. It's a matter of investigation to find out what the link is. It could have been different. And therefore, logically, there might not have been any link. Right. So I think that's a possible argument. It's a David Hume type argument, right? David Hume said, uh, whatever you can imagine as distinct is distinct. Okay. Now, he might have been wrong, but if you think he was right, then you're going to say, well, you can have experiences, mental content, you can have consciousness without uh, a brain, or without anything physical at all. Now, I'm not saying human beings are like that, but I am saying, of course, God is like that. God certainly has consciousness, and God doesn't have a brain. It's absurd to think that God had a brain somewhere out beyond Alpha Centauri, and God uh, doesn't have a body, so God has nothing physical. So anybody who believes in God thinks, well, there, are, there is a being which has knowledge. God knows everything, they tell me. So, there is a being which has knowledge, but it doesn't have anything physical, no brain. Well, I think, uh, it seems to me, you'd have to say that's a possibility. It's not just nonsense. There could be states of knowledge uh, which are not um, correlated with any brain. It wouldn't be the sort of knowledge we have. And in fact, God's knowledge would be the knowledge of every possible state that could ever exist in every possible universe which is amazingly unlike human knowledge. Human knowledge does depend upon our looking at things and gaining information from our environment. But God's knowledge doesn't depend on that. God knows every possible universe before any universe actually exists, if you can say that. So I think the argument that there could be a God is a very strong one. Uh, I, somebody who used to teach me, called A.J. Eyre, A-Y-E-R, A.J. Eyre, used to say that the word God was nonsensical. Do you know about the verification principle? Of course you do, right? But do you, do you really know what it says? The verification principle in the hands of A.J. Eyre said, the meaning of a statement is the method of its verification. So what, what the word God, for example, means is how you would set about finding out that there is a God. I would set out showing that it was true. And then I said, if you had any statement which you couldn't, in principle, verify by sense experience, uh, it was meaningless. It didn't have any meaning at all. But of course, he's just wrong. I mean, it's just absolutely false. And I don't know how he ever believed it. And he did give up the belief, and he apologized. So he said, yeah, and he said, in a radio interview with me, as a matter of fact, which is in the BBC archives, he said, well, the only thing wrong with uh, my philosophy was that it was mistaken. So he did say that, he's on record. It's even in a book called The Central Questions of Philosophy, which he gave later in his life. Uh, so you mustn't be impressed by the verification principle over much. Uh, and because you can think of things where it doesn't apply, let me give you just a, a very simple thing that all physicists, well, you can never say all physicists, which almost all physicists would agree with, and that is there could be a multiverse. Okay, now what's a multiverse? Well, a multiverse is a lot of different universes other than this one. This universe is a space-time, okay, uh, but there can be other space-times with other beings in. Now, all, most physicists would say, well, of course that's possible. In fact, it's probably even true. And um, people like Martin Rees, the astronomer royal, believe in multiverses. So does Brian Cox. Brian Cox says there, are, there is a multiverse. There are lots of other universes. Brian Cox says some incredible things. One of the most incredible and obviously lunatic things that he says is... Everything that can happen does happen. Have you heard him say that? Well, he has said it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, he ought to take that one back pretty quickly. Everything that can happen does happen. For a start, if there could be a God, then there is one, if that's true. If he says everything that can happen does happen, then he believes the ontological argument. If there could be a God, there is one. And he doesn't really want to believe that. He also wants to believe that, of course, since it can happen that I kill my mother and eat her for breakfast, then that somewhere in the universe that happens. Or there's some universe in which I'm eating my mother for breakfast. Uh, does he really want to hold that? I mean, the multiverse theory can get very weird. Well, let's not go into that. I just think it's so weird that it's much weirder than any religion I've ever heard of, even Scientology. 
So, uh, I don't think much of the multiverse theory, but most physicists do, and my point is, the statement, everything that can happen does happen, makes perfect sense to you, even though it's weird, but you couldn't possibly verify it. Therefore, the verification principle is simply mistaken. It's not right. Uh, statements have meaning, even if you can't verify them. Even if there's no way in principle you could verify them. You can't get into another universe to see if it's really there. It's just not possible. So the multiverse could only exist as a postulate of, of a, of a phys physical theory, but it couldn't ever be verified. Right? So uh, statements about things, there are uh, lots of statements you couldn't verify. So, so much for the verification principle. So, uh, you can say, well, that, that, the verification principle wouldn't be an objection uh, to the existence of a mind without a body. If there were a mind without a body, like God, of course, you wouldn't be able to verify that it existed because there would be nothing for you to see. Right? There would be no sense experiences of God that were even possible. Uh, so, that's not, God is not going to be subject to the verification principle. Perhaps you remember, while talking about that, that John Hick whose 90th birthday was yesterday, um, John Hick actually uh, said uh, that after you were dead, you might verify God by seeing him sitting on a throne. But of course, he didn't mean that because God doesn't sit on a throne at all, right? Not literally. So you wouldn't even verify it then. You might have a, such an overpowering sense of the presence of God that you couldn't help believing in God. Would that be verification? It wouldn't be sense experience. And there you've got a bit of a puzzle about verification. Would it include experiences which are not sense experiences, like having a very strong sense of the presence of God. Well, if it includes that, then of course it doesn't rule out God at all anyway. Okay. So that's AJ. Uh, I just talked about him because, I don't know why I talked about him, because it's Saturday morning and I haven't had my breakfast. Right. Quantum physics. Now, what I've been talking about is the question of whether you ultimate reality can be mind-like, and what I've said, you might not have noticed, but I think I've said anyway, uh, that it could be, it could be the case that there's a mind which has knowledge and power, causal power, but no embodiment, which in fact thinks about the possible universes that could exist and makes one of them exist, or makes lots of them exist if it wants to. So it's possible to have such a uh, uh, position. It's, it's not a, a ludicrous or meaningless assertion, but is it true? Well, now, I'm now going to point to some things in quantum physics which actually, perhaps surprisingly, uh, give it a certain amount of plausibility from within physics itself. And I'm just going to take three topics here, uh, and because of time, really, they're going to be rather brief. You can follow them up. Uh, Brian Cox has written, actually, a book about quantum physics, um, a little bit boring, but uh, nevertheless worth reading. And he doesn't say quite the things I'm going to say, so it's quite interesting to look at an alternative view. I'll try and make clear where he would agree with me and where he wouldn't. First of all, indeterminacy. You've all heard of Heisenberg's principle of indeterminacy, yes? Has anybody not? I mean, just because I'll tell you what it is if you haven't. Principle, okay, you're yeah, right here. Okay. Uh, quantum mechanics began in 1925. That was the first quantum mechanics system, and uh, Heisenberg was one of the people who invented the first mathematical technique. Let me, let me say just first of all, it's certainly true. Quantum mechanics works. It's true. Nobody doubts it. Uh, you wouldn't have transistors or televisions or iPhones without it, right? So quantum mechanics is necessary to the modern world. But what it says is so incredible that no physicist can quite believe it. Right? It's just utterly unimaginable. What it has done is revolutionized physics. Right? If you, and so what I'm going to be getting at here is that matter is a myth. Right? Now I've said that religious people probably want to say that spirit is at least as real as matter, and they probably want to say spirit is more real, ultimately, than matter is. And I want to hold that quantum physics actually shows you from within the sciences themselves that talk about matter is an ancient, discredited myth. So what is matter? Right. I'm going to oversimplify just a little bit. I've only got 10 minutes. You, you know, can't really blame me. Um, why is it a myth? If, uh, if you want to read a book called The Matter Myth, it's by Paul Davies and John Gribben, perfectly respectable scientists. Uh, and it, uh, it's in Penguin, I think. It's called The Matter Myth. What they mean by that is, 
People used to think they knew what matter was. Matter was little hard, massy particles. Newton defined it as such. Little hard, massy particles moving around in accordance with inviolable laws of nature. Newton thought God could violate them, but otherwise they always worked. So you've got little hard things like billiard balls, atoms, going around. Now, there are no such things in the universe, ultimately. You know that people are looking in CERN, in Geneva, in the Large Hadron Collider, for the Higgs boson. And I don't know if you have the slightest idea where a Higgs boson is. It is something which gives mass to everything in the universe, gives weight, heaviness to everything in the universe. Now, you might think the Higgs boson, or you might think that electrons are particles. You know, you've got a picture in your mind, perhaps, of electrons, of little particles going around the nucleus of an atom. Yeah, everybody knows that little picture. Well, again, that's false. That's totally false for quantum physics. Electrons are not particles. Absolutely not. They are fields. Right? And they are in many different places at the same time, as a field is. I mean, the field is sort of spread out. It's not in one particular place. And to cut a long story short, um, whether you, when you see an electron as a particle, it's because you have carried out an experiment on a subatomic reality which makes it appear as a particle. But if you carried out a different experiment, it would appear as a wave. It's called the wave-particle duality. So electrons are both waves and particles at the same time. And the Higgs boson, just to tell you what it is, won't help you in the slightest, is a field which is infinite in extent, and the boson is a small ripple in that field. Okay, so it's not a particle. <laughs> so when people talk about as a particle, they're just simplifying. They're really talking about, can we detect a ripple in the infinite field uh, uh, which gives mass to everything in the universe? And if you say, well, what about this field? What is its nature? A quantum physicist will say to you, very likely, this field is in 11 dimensions. Now, we know three dimensions, you know, up, down, left, right. That's, that's about it, really. Time could be a fourth dimension, some people say. But 11 dimensions, what on earth could they be? I haven't the clue. But a quantum physicist will say that the ultimate realities now are not material particles moving in accordance with deterministic laws. They are fields which exist in 11 dimensions with ripples in them. In fact, the truth is, they are totally unimaginable. You can do mathematics about them, but you can't interpret the mathematics. For example, just a simple example, a very important number in quantum mechanics is the square root of minus one. But if you know what the square root of minus one is, you wouldn't be sitting in this room. You'd be getting a Nobel Prize. Uh, so it's an irrational number, the square root of minus one. You can't interpret it, but it's useful. It's necessary, not just useful, it's necessary in quantum mechanics. So the physical world has disappeared into a mathematical world, a platonic world, you might say, and people like Roger Penrose do say that the mathematical world is more real than the physical world, because after all, the physical world is only one possible state of the way things are, the most famous equation of all time, do you know what it is? Of course you do, you have to, by definition, if it's the most famous equation of all time. It has to be, of course, E equals MC squared. And E equals MC squared says matter, mass, is equivalent to energy. Energy equals mass and the square of the speed of light, and a little bit more as well. So. Uh, Energy and mass are interchangeable. So mass has disappeared into energy. Okay? So matter has actually, at the quantum level, disappeared. You've got energy. And you have lots of different forms of energy. Waves, particles, fields, forces, all sorts of things. Well, let's go through these quickly. Indeterminacy. Heisenberg's principle of indeterminacy is this. First of all, a correct statement of it is this. It is impossible, it is impossible to detect both the position and the momentum of a fundamental particle. That's it. That's the principle of indeterminacy. Now, there's a, an interpretation of this called the Copenhagen interpretation, which most physicists accept, which says this is not a, just a subjective matter, it's an objective indeterminacy. That is, uh, this, whatever the reality is, 
it does not have both position and location at the same time. That's an objective indeterminacy. To put it bluntly, it doesn't have position unless you observe it. And it doesn't have momentum unless you observe it in a different way. So what does it have? Well, we don't know what it has. We only know it as it appears to us when we experimentally interfere with it. It's a very ancient philosophical view, this, and Niels Bohr, a great quantum physicist, explicitly referred to Immanuel Kant, saying we only know appearances, we don't know the reality. Right? We only know um, things as they appear, we don't know things as they are in themselves. And quantum physicists would unanimously agree with this. We don't know what reality is. So it's a bit hard to be a materialist now if you don't know what reality is anymore. You, don't, you just know how it appears. Okay. So one thing indeterminacy does is destroy determinism. I'm being very... Uh, what I'm saying here is this is what most quantum physicists would think. Of course, nothing is uncontroversial in this area. But let's take the majority view. Indeterminacy destroys determinism because what it says is uh, there is not just one way that things have to go. You know, each cause produces one and only one effect, so you could predict everything in the universe from its beginning. We know that is false. We know that is false. There's no question about it. You could not, in principle, predict the course of the universe, even if you knew everything about it. You still couldn't predict what was going to happen next. You couldn't do it. Now, philosophically speaking, you say there are two interpretations of this. One is you can't predict it, but there might, it might be determined. We just could never find out. Well, that's a big victory, of course, for the indeterminists already, because you can never establish it. Again, it's a faith statement. If you say there is something determining it, Einstein always thought that, as a matter of fact. He always thought there were what they call hidden variables, things underneath, that make, determining things to happen. But it was a pure faith statement. Most people think he was wrong. He spent the whole of the end of his life trying to prove it and failed. Uh, but he might have been right, you know, who knows. Uh, but what most physicists think is, no, um, it's not just that you can't predict it, it's actually not fixed. The future is open. There are alternative futures. You can continue sitting there, or you can get up and walk out. It's not fixed. You're really free. Now, you may feel conventionally bound to go on doing what you're doing, but there's no inflexible law which makes you do so. Right? And quantum physics says that is true at every level, really, particularly at the most basic level. Uh, the future is open. There are alternative futures. It's not just you can't predict it. Uh, it might be different. It might change. So that's indeterminacy. The universe is probabilistic or open. Right? Now, already that lets in God, if you want to put it that way. It's a bit crude, but you say, if everything was fixed deterministically, and everything had to follow, all these material particles had to follow deterministic laws, there'd be no way that God could get into the system without interfering in it. We had the interference model. David Hume's terrible statement that a miracle is a violation of a law of nature. A ridiculous statement. Uh, which couldn't be a good definition of miracle because nobody thought there were laws of nature before Isaac Newton. So couldn't possibly what a miracle really is. But however, it's become standard in every exam paper at A-level to say, Dave, but always say, David Hume said. Don't say a miracle is a violation of a law of nature. That was David Hume's terrible definition of it. But in fact, of course, uh, that belongs with a classical physical view of determinism. God has to break the laws. But if you've got an open universe where you, don't, you only have probabilistic laws anyway, well, to put it in a very crude way, well, there are spaces in which people can act, <laughs> right? There are alternative futures. There might be other forms of causality. There might be mental causality, or what Aristotle called final causality. We can't rule it out, because there's no way in which we can know everything about the universe and its future. There's no way that's ruled out by quantum physics. Okay, I know that's a bit short, but it's exciting to me. I'm excited. Whee! Co secondly, consciousness. What, that, what was this is, I've mentioned this, it is... Uh, what you know about the world in quantum physics is what depends on what experiments you use to find out. There are two famous experiments, so I won't go into that. Uh, but one of them gives you a particle at a particular location as an electron. Another one gives you a wave, which is not at all a particle. Right? It's a spread out wave. And it depends on how you interact 
with the experimental situation, which of those results you get. Okay. Now, everybody agrees with that. The interpretation is more difficult, and this is where Brian Cox probably would disagree with what I'm going to say, but pro quantum physicists like Steven Weinberg, um, uh, uh, Feynman, uh, Henry Stapp, uh, Niels Bohr himself, a huge number of them say this. Uh, it's a particular interpretation of the data. They say, without consciousness, fundamental subatomic phenomena would not have position or momentum. They wouldn't exist unless they were observed. John Wheeler is probably the best known person to have said that, uh, but I meet lots of quantum physicists who, who do say it. Uh, in fact, a lot of quantum physicists in Oxford, most of them do say that, and they would say, yeah, what you see is produced by your consciousness. Shouldn't be too hard to follow that because we know that the colours that we see in this room, my favourite example, I suppose, are produced by, they're not real. You know, if we all shut our eyes, there wouldn't be any colours in this room because colour is produced simply by your brain. That, uh, but all there are are electromagnetic waves. Okay. So that's what quantum physicists are saying, but they're pushing it further. They're saying there wouldn't be even any electromagnetic waves unless that's how you observed whatever it is. So they're not saying there's no reality. They're saying the reality there is is completely unimaginable by us. But if we interact with it, we see it in a certain way. So consciousness is essential to the way we see the world. So this world, which looks like a solid three-dimensional world, is actually a product of consciousness. There is, of course, a world out there, yeah, but it's not like this at all. This world is produced by consciousness. So consciousness becomes much more important. So here's a nice clue. So first of all, the universe is more open than we thought. Secondly, consciousness is much more important to it. And Roger Penrose, uh, um, who is professor of mathematics at uh, Oxford, uh, has said uh, that the laws of physics will have to change to include consciousness somehow because of quantum phenomena and because consciousness is involved in very deciding the basis of physical nature itself. Finally, the most interesting of all, uh, entanglement. There's a thing called the Bell Theorem, uh, and again, Brian Cox would accept the Bell Theorem. What it, uh, what it says is, once two, let's call them particles, have interacted, they will continue to interact instantaneously throughout the whole of their existence, however far apart they are. And nobody knows how to understand that, though every quantum physicist thinks it's true. It's called non locality. So if uh, a photon comes into existence a billion light years away from here, it will actually have an effect on things happening in this room. Now the effect would be so small, I mean it's very, very small, that we're not going to notice it. But we might. You know, there, there are crucial instances at which very small events might cause huge catastrophic uh, consequences, but they don't very often happen. That goes back to probability. You know, they, they very rarely happen. But entanglement means the universe is such that we can never, in principle, know every causal factor which is producing the world of our experience. In other words, we can never, in principle, eliminate a god who is active in the universe. And that's a strict, of course, Brian Cox doesn't say that, but it follows from what he would say, right? He doesn't talk about God at all, but it follows that there, there are causal influences that we don't know anything about. A good example of that is dark energy and dark matter. A hundred years ago, nobody would have thought there was even any such thing. Now, we'd say, well, these are influences we didn't know about. So how could anybody ever say, I've got all the laws, I know what they are, they don't leave room for any other sort of causal influence. So let me summarize what I've said here and come to a conclusion. I've said in quantum physics, some of the old objections to a mental reality being the fundamental reality in the universe, some of those objections have fallen away, and the evidence seems to be pointing more towards mind as the fundamental reality. One is the universe is open, uh, so, uh, 
There aren't any deterministic, mechanistic laws. Mechanism is dead. Mechanism is just dead. So it's a different, more dynamic universe. Secondly, consciousness is quite important to the universe, even to the fundamental way in which we think things exist. The world wouldn't be like this at all if it were not for consciousness. And what it would be like, we don't know. And thirdly, entanglement. Things are interconnected in ways that we can't even guess and we can't possibly get an information.